Hey, this is Rod Cleef, and you are listening to the Mailbox Money Show with Bronson Hill. All right. So the triple net lease is something that involves basically you owning land and you get to uh, really get reimbursed for insurance, uh, any taxes and any sort of, you know, typically the tenant will do the build out. So you just basically own the land. You don't have to pay for much. There's a little bit of operational, but not very much operational expense. And so a lot of people that are wealthy like it because it's more stable. It has a, a lot of uh, characteristics that are very similar to a debt fund. There is some risk that, of course, even a solid tenant could potentially move or break their lease. But some of these leases are really guaranteed by publicly traded companies. So there's uh, a lot of amazing stuff about it. So Kenny Wolf, my friend, is going to talk about triple net leases. Maybe you've gotten involved with these. Maybe you're interested to understand how they work. This is going to be a great episode to learn and also to see kind of what's happening in the market right now. Because there's a market... Uh, that specific market is uh, there's challenges there, but there's also opportunities. And um, I, I just really enjoyed the conversation. I think you're really going to enjoy uh, this episode with Kenny Wolf. Kenny, welcome to the show. Excited to have you on the Mailbox Money Show today. Thanks, Bronson. I appreciate you having me, man. Awesome, man. Well, I know I saw you recently at uh, one of your conferences that you put on. You guys do uh, multiple, you know, these one day events in different cities each year. So I was in Houston. I was a panelist there, which was a lot of fun. But how many you guys have been doing that for what at least four or five years, right, or more than that? Yeah, even. I think we're at six now. I mean, it's it's been a, it's been a while since we've done it, and uh, it's been fun. And we got we got it cranked up, and then COVID hit, and then we had to crank it back up. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, but it's exciting. It's always a fun a fun one day event, and. Uh, you know, 16 hour day. I don't know what it is. It's a long day, but it's fun. <laughs> yeah, that, that is a lot. I was going to say we've done, uh, we did a one day event in LA, um, uh, last fall with 170 people. And it's just, it's, it's so much work that goes into it. Like a conference, they say it's like easier to do like a multi-day thing almost because you, you just, you set it up one time and then you're kind of just organized. Like it's not as hard for day two and three, but you guys have like kind of spreading in different parts of the country and it's only one day. Yeah. So you found it really reaches a lot of people you wouldn't reach at just one big conference. Right. Yeah, and it's it's on the, it's over the weekend too. So like Friday night, there's a VIP dinner. Saturday nine to about five five thirty, and then there's networking till by two a.m. I don't know. Yeah. I mean it's late, so you know you can go as long as you can ha handle. But uh, then Sunday I usually fly out, so it's it's a quick quick trip. Um, some of those you know over two three days, I, I think you uh, lose people. Um, there's some you know, not for pokes, it's tough to take a full week off and go to a, to a conference. I feel like I, I can't do it. Uh, so I know other people will probably have issues with that too. So, um, yeah. so we're trying to make it condensed, uh, get, get some really great kind of national speakers in there and, uh, um, just banging out in a day. Yeah, no, it's a great event. I got to meet actually, we, uh, he's coming on the show soon is Walker Diable, the, uh, uh, buy then bill, the private equity guy, just super interesting story. And now yeah. he's got about buying small businesses, which is great, but I highly recommend your event that people check that out. Well, can you give us a little bit of background? I know you've been doing this for a long time. You've been in multifamily, you guys have been in development, you've done a lot of different things. Um, how did you get started at all this? What was your background? Like, how did you, how'd you get into real estate? Sure. So um, uh, we're based here in Dallas, Fort Worth. I'm a, a bona fide Texan, I guess. I uh, wasn't born here, but got here as fast as I could, as they say. <laughs> I've heard that before. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, but I, so I went into the oil and gas business right out of uh, Baylor University here um, into the into the accounting world uh, with CFO at 28 years old of a spinoff company. Um, they gave us $20 million budget a month to spend. And to reinvest, wow. and so we we did that uh, at a very, pretty young age. Uh, the president was twenty eight, my, and my wife was admin at twenty eight as well. So we we're all over there and just worked hard. Um, and we leased a lot of minerals, flipped those, and then our sole client was Chesapeake Energy. Uh, they were having money issues the first time, and so I decided, you know what, we probably need to get some do something outside of uh, oil and gas because uh, it's very feast or famine in that industry. Uh, highly cyclical. Um, they always overproduce. They can't help themselves. So, uh, so it's it's a big you know crash and burn every time. But but I wanted to get into something that um, obviously um, um, everything has cycles, but something with a little more even keel cycles, anyways. Um, so real estate's always spoken to me. I had a huge library of of uh, real estate books. Um, didn't really know where to start, uh, and then went to a few of these you know guru events. Um, the uh, uh, you know, two or three of the, uh, two or three of the, um, there, I went to two of them, uh, and then there are two or three day events. Uh, and so, uh, one of them kind of really spoke to us. So the first day they talked about single family. Uh, so we looked at that and then we're, ex my, my wife and then, and I were excited, uh, about, you know, buying 10, 10 single family units. We're all gung ho. And then, then the next day they talked about multifamily and we, when we scrapped single family altogether. So we jumped right into multifamily. 
Um, I've never owned a single family rental in my life. Um, just running a multifamily and then um, did two passive investments to kind of learn the ropes, knowing I wanted to be a syndicator. So deal three, I syndicated a uh, 76 unit uh, multifamily deal in Wiley, Texas. Okay. Amazing. And then now you have how many <laughs> units and have raised how much money? And I mean, yeah, it really, it really took off. So we, we've done over 9,500 9, units in six states. Uh, we've raised $220 million since 2010 uh, and uh, has just, and then branched out, like you said. Um, so seven years ago, got into ground up development and multifamily. Uh, we have multiple projects going on right now in Ohio and Texas uh, on ground up multi and then um, about the same time, jumped into triple net and double net investing. So uh, we've got 62 CVS, Walgreens, Dollar Generals, Family Dollars, Verizon Corporates, a wide range of, of, of retail tenants um, in 17 states. Uh, we're a lot less picky on that, um, but those are great for monthly cash flow. Um, so those are the three areas we play in. Yeah, I know you've done a lot of things and there's a lot of stuff that you are interested in. And you're like me, you know, there's so many things in real estate you can do. Uh, but I wanted to talk, uh, you know, specifically this this show about uh, triple net because I know a lot of people are interested in that, particularly you know doctors or a lot of wealthy individuals, just because it, it is a much more stable way to own uh, a property. You don't, you know, triple net. You don't have to pay for the build out. You're not paying for the taxes, the insurance, that kind of stuff. But you're just getting monthly cash flow, which is great. And then of course the property will appreciate over time. And these are, like you said, CVS or Starbucks or other types of. Uh, right. you know, well-known businesses, but take us a little bit into the background of, of maybe how you got into triple net, what you like about it, what some of the challenges are, just give us a little bit of an overview of, of triple net. Yeah, sure. So um, really, I talked to um, Paul Peebles with Old Capital Lending. Uh, yeah. if, if you don't know Paul, you should. Um, the, uh, <laughs> um, uh, but anyway, so I talked to him, I was like, what do people do after multifamily? Uh, not that I wanted to move on from multifamily because we still do that, but I wanted to see if there was a progression, right? A lot of folks think from single family, you go to multifamily, which I skip, but you can do that. Um, just, you know, what's next? And so he said a lot of folks, um, um, a lot of folks go for, uh, from uh, multifamily over to either medical office or triple net. Um, and, the re and he said the reason is not because you make more money is because it's a lot less stressful. Um, there's a lot less operating risk. Um, so that's that that really kind of uh, drew my attention because we had at, we had a few of our investors reach out and wanted more of a kind of a monthly stable cash flow deal. Um, and I love multifamily, but that is not it. It's operational heavy. Um, you're gonna you got to chase rent and fix toilets, right? And so you're yeah. so you're and so at, at best you're probably gonna do quarterly distributions, and they're still gonna fluctuate because it depends on how much you had to fix and how much rent you collected. So um, so anyway, so that's that's kind of why we did it. It was really a request from our investors for more of a stable monthly. ACH show up in my bank account and drive around my RV. You know, that's what they were looking for. And so that's kind of how we designed this. Um, and then uh, what kind of to a finer point, what drove me to um, more of a retail um, setting was I had um, my wife's from a small town called Fairfield, Texas. Uh, if you blink, you'll, you'll, you'll miss a driving from Dallas to Houston, but it's right on the highway, but uh, it's, it's not huge. Um, a town about 3000 people, but they, um, um, known her for about 20 years now, over 20 years. And they, uh, they've had four different dollar stores open at the same time. And, mm. and so if a town of 3000 people can keep four of those dollar stores, you know, yeah. three of them, the major brands we know and love uh, force a knockoff, um, open for 20 years. I mean, okay. I, I like this business model. Like it doesn't take much to keep them open. Right. And so anyway, so that's kind of what, what got us going. And that first fund um, was like pulling teeth because uh, I was the multifamily guy at that yeah. point. And so people didn't know he was that. lost his damn mind. Uh, yeah. stores, right. So I, I bought, I mean, I'm not raising only like, I think like a million seven in that first fund and over a year, which I was used to raising that probably in a day, you know, at the time yeah, yeah, right. Think, or whatever. It was uh, like pulling teeth, but it's a lot of education um, yeah. for our investors. Um, but we bought seven uh, dollar stores in Texas and Oklahoma, and then kept branching out. And so now we're, like I said, we've got multiple types of uh, tenants of, over different industries and a lot of states now as well. So the benefits of this, obviously you're getting a return. It's a it's a safer return because you, you own the land. Uh, there's debt on the land typically as well, right? So there's debt right. there, but it's, you're having, I guess the, the safety part is hopefully you're in a uh, an area where you just, the tenant is a good tenant and you're not having to worry about, um, any of the other issues that go with that. And then is there some tax benefits as well? And what, what kind of cash flow? I guess, what do, should people 
we're not talking about a specific deal, but just kind of what sort of range is kind of reasonable for triple net when people look at it? Yeah. So, um, so the, um, uh, the operational risk is way down on these, like you said, so you've got, um, um, all of our tenants are high credit tenants. Um, only one tenant is not publicly traded. So, you know, mm. Dollar General, the corporate, you know, publicly traded company guarantees our, our rent. So we know that's coming in, right? So we've, mm -hmm. since 27, we started this in 2017, our first fund, uh, triple net fund in 2017. We've never had a missed mortgage payment. And I've never, even through COVID, we didn't have any of our tenants ask for a rent reduction. Um, it was fantastic. So we focused on the high credit folks. Um, and that's been, that, that was amazing. Because some of our, mm. our friends and colleagues that did strip malls, um, they definitely had requests during COVID and they were very yeah. all through COVID about who was going to actually pay rent <laughs> and who wasn't. Um, yeah. but anyway, so we, uh, so, so we focused on the high credit folks. So you've got some really awesome guarantors on these, on the rent coming in. And then depending on the lease, they take care of 90 to hundred percent of the operational expenses mm -hmm. as well. So you've got, and then it just varies by, um, by tenant. The worst one is always family dollar of ours anyways. <laughs> um, we love them to death, but their 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 lease is the more most forgiving for them. But uh, we we're basically in charge of the structure, the roof, um, the uh, parking lot, and then part of the HVAC. But that's it. Everything else is on them. If the window breaks, they, they fix it. Uh, toilet, whatever that they, they they fix yeah. the vast majority, uh, and then they always reimburse us for property taxes and insurance as well, which is amazing. Uh, especially since insurance and property taxes have been a huge challenge on the multifamily front. Yeah. Uh, last couple of years. Um, so anyway, so that that's that's huge. So you've got a, a great guaranteed rent, you know, coming in. You've got very minimal operational risk um, on the expense side, and then we 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 always went in and bought bought um, fixed rate in, interest rate loans. Um, yeah. And so we know within probably a couple percent of what our monthly revenue is going to be every single month. And so that's right. kind of how we were able to design a monthly stable cash flow. Right. And we've been hitting between, depends on the fund, but seven and a half to all the way to almost 11% cash okay. on cash. Um, it depends on uh, 2020 fund was fantastic. We were buying these at like six and seven, I think average was 7.25 cap rate. Wow. Uh, and then our average interest rate, I think was like 3.8%. So a huge <laughs> spread. I mean, so yeah. the 2020 yeah. fund is probably, probably the best cash on cash. Wow. It's probably not the best appreciation. Um, we've had, you know, the 2017 fund, we were buying these before it was cool. Um, and then uh, um, and then 2022 and 2023, we actually saw um, cap rate, um, a big cap rate uh, decompression in the retail space of almost two bips. I mean, wow. so we're buying a dollar general right now um, in the Texas panhandle um, for an eight and a half cap, which those, you know, used to go at wow. maybe six, six and a quarter max back two years ago. So yeah. the thinking is that once we get interest rates to come down in a year or two, whatever it takes, you know, yeah. yes, we're going to get right. some reduction again. I don't know if it's a full two bips or not, but even if it's one, it's a huge appreciation that we don't really ex expect on these kind of deals. Yeah. So that's a good question because I know um, really this is a great rule for real estate. Really, if your cost of debt is lower than your cash flow or your cap rates, you're, you're in, a, in a good position. So how is that now if you're eight and a half on this Texas Panhandle property? Like what kind of interest rates are you getting on that property when you're buying it? We should lock in about a 6.3 right now. Um, okay. That's pretty regional good. Bank. Um, so okay. we're still hitting about that a little over a 2% cap rate spread. Um, that's kind of our, our minimum uh, that we like to hit. Obviously, the, the bigger, the better. But uh, but yeah, that's your, you know, uh, and and the distress is coming too because a lot of folks uh, in 21, 22 were buying these negative leverage. Um, and they're especially yeah. negative leverage now. They're buying those at five and a half caps. You know, so if they have any renewals coming up this year or next, when the interest rates are higher than what their cap rate is, they bought it at. That's where you're going to see a lot of distress in the in the triple net market. Wow. And we're starting to see okay. a few of those now. Yeah. So let me ask you this: I know there are people that um, do this on their own. I know there's doctors and other people that do triple net, and they go buy and they do some of this. Um, you guys obviously create a kind of a uh, you know, a passive or mailbox money experience for people. Uh, right. What are some pitfalls, whether someone wants to do it themselves or they invest passively with a group or with you guys, like what are, what are some things just to kind of like look out for? Obviously the negative leverage is one. If you're, you know, if your cap rate is lower than your financing or, or things like that, right. it's obviously That's a concern. Good. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. I mean, they definitely don't be negative leveraged. I mean, so, uh, but there's folks out here that just pay cash for them and they're, you know, are, are fine flipping off a six and a half unlevered return. 
Um, I think it's a little crazy, but you know, to each their own, uh, you know, it's a lot of cash out and put in. Um, we did back off on our uh, leverage amount. So prior to, so early part of 22, we were still doing a 70 to 75% leverage. Uh, once interest rates started to go up, we started back off to, you know, 50 to 60% max leverage, um, which, um, it slowed the amount of stores we could buy, but it also, um, it was the best kind of, we've got a, obviously an underwriting tool that, um, that we, you know, slammed the numbers in and because of the interest rates, it made it a, a much better option, at least for now to go to the lower leverage. Um, so watch your leverage, don't over lever. Um, yeah. you can, you know, you can use that too much. Um, uh, and then, um, we were getting six, six months IO from, from our, our lender. So try to get that from your lender if you can. Um, yeah. and then they're always 25 year amortizing loans. So you're building up a lot of equity quick, uh, in those stores. Um, the other pitfall I'd say too, is it, so all of our stores are, sing are single tenant. So it's like owning a single family, one single family home. That's the most risky part of ever owning a portfolio of single family homes is one, because yeah. you need, it'd be much better to have three because then if there's any vacancy, you can offset the mortgage, right? So you, so that's why we set these up as a fund. As a fund, because um, you can offset. We have, yeah, so we have, I mean, our 20, I don't know, 22 fund, we had um, raised uh, 20 million and those investors are in 26 different stores over different industries, over different ge geographies. I mean, so it's a very, uh, it's the more you can buy, the better to to de-risk um, over industries and uh, locations and vacancy risk as well. Yeah. Um, so we had to, it, it's it's it is a lot less hands on obviously, um, but once you probably pick up, I don't know, as an individual, I, I'd guess f four or five. I don't know. Um, um, you're gonna you, you probably want to have someone manage that because so we have an in house. We had to create our own property management net PM uh, company um, because even though we um, um, uh, they reimburse us for property taxes and insurance, that means we have to front it pay it and then get reimbursed from these folks. And so that is, that is uh, um, a challenge. Hard to collect sometimes. <laughs> you get, you gotta have sometimes you gotta, up, you gotta yeah. know the right people to hurry, speed it up. Um, so anyway, so, so we did create that, uh, that net PM. Uh, we do have two assets that we third party manage folks for uh, because they just wanted to, you know, hand it over and let someone else manage it for them. But yeah. um, I mean, one or two, you, you're, it's going to be a hobby for you once you get to four or five, yeah. it's some real work. So, yeah. That's yeah, interesting. Yeah, a lot of people think things are passive and then it's, oh, you just do this. But if you can't scale it up and you can't do you a certain number and it's, it takes some work. Um, what are the, are there, are there some, also some uh, depreciation benefits? So you get kind of the bonus accelerated depreciation if you purchase yeah. or involved in something uh -huh. like this. Yeah, we get that just not as much. I mean, we don't have as much right. car appliances, like comparing it to multifamily where we get a lot of write-off. Um, so whereas I'll tell, say a, a year ago, we were writing off about 50% of the initial investment for multifamily investors. Um, we'd probably get 35% on it, on our family dollar. We just don't have as much you know, it, like um, actual, you know, flooring and, and, and depreciable yeah. assets inside the building as we do as multifamily. Um, Cause it's yeah. not our, it's not our stores. It's, it's not our refrigerator. It's not our, you know, shelving or whatever. Yeah, that makes sense. No, it, it, it makes sense. Um, talk to us a little bit about, um, and I appreciate you sharing about the triple net space here. So this is obviously for an investor who's a little more, um, it, it's to me, it's, it seems similar like a debt fund or we have a debt fund we're doing or things like it seems a little bit more like that where it's lower returns, but it's, you're in a more safe position. And, you know, of course the risk is that the tenant doesn't pay or you're in an area that's just maybe an obscure area that if you lose a tenant, it can take a while to find another one. Those are kind of the big, or like not having enough of them to, have some diversity, right? To where, you know, you have single tenant, but you've got, you know, 30 locations. So it's, if one goes, it's not that big of a deal compared to what it would be otherwise. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And you just got to be ready to, to replace tenants. I mean, it's, you know, so you look, if we, if I'll pick on Walgreens, if you have a Walgreens, you, we always ask, okay, where, where's the closest CVS or, you know, local pharmacy. And then the other question, the other thing too, is you're seeing a lot of Dollar Generals um, trade up to the size of a Walgreens or CVS, right? So you can look at multiple industries to fill that space. Um, it's funny that folks think that retailers are going away, but they're actually wanting more space, more floor space. Uh, with Dollar General wanting to go into these Walgreens, and then you're seeing, um, you know, um, AutoZone, O'Reilly's want to trade up to the size of a dollar store. Um, so you kind of look at multiple to trade them up that way. But that is something that is the if you're if you know the, that is a, a risk is is the a replacement of the tenant. Um, so far, we've had very good success at that, or um, um, on, on all the all the the two or three that we had to do that on. 
Yeah, that's good. I mean, it's good to uh, to be aware of what's what's happening. It is interesting how trends are are changing. Where you know, dollar stores are are wanting to go to bigger places or or AutoZone or things like that. I know there's obviously people do you know triple net for different types of you know hotels or or industrial other things as well. But you know, when you're you know, the retail setting can be really attractive. Um, so I want to talk a little bit as well on the show about uh, multifamily for a few minutes because I know this is your bread and butter and I've done a ton of multifamily, but 200 million multifamily and um, things have changed. It's been very different the last couple of years, you know, it's, yes, uh, absolutely. Um, and you know, we've gotten, we've had some issues with bridge debt on a couple of deals and uh, it's been, you know, pricing has come down and some are, you know, it's funny, everybody thinks the real estate market is just the real estate market, but it's, you know, single family's gone up 3% really since COVID nationally. And a lot of, you know, multifamily, especially value add has gone down 20 to 35% in some areas, just depending on how it's going. Are you, well, what, what's your kind of outlook right now on multifamily as an investor? Yeah. I mean, I think it's still, um, it's still changing. Um, like you said, we're starting to see those discounts like that, but they're, but they're quietly marketed. Like the, it's these banks that are calling a few of us in the, in the business um, to buy them, to buy these notes quietly. Um, yeah. so there are definitely a stuff trading, um, but it doesn't seem like it's it's not hitting the brokers yet. Um, I mean, somewhat, but but not not in a big way. I mean, we're seeing portfolio like a telling you earlier. I mean, we're seeing a portfolio of eight straight from a bank that we could buy the notes on all here in Texas. So that's 65, 70 um, percent um, of the you know peak pricing in 22, you know. Mm-hmm. And that's what they're coming out asking for. So I'm hoping to get a better discount than that, right? Uh, one yeah. can hope. That's what that's our job, Ransom, is to is yeah. the hammer them down. Um, <laughs> exactly. But, uh, but you're seeing that. But at the same time, I'm selling two assets right now um, under contract that were, you know, probably not 22 pricing, but probably 21 pricing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they're stable assets. They can go out and get Fannie Freddie on them. I mean, so that's um, so it's all, it's still this kind of tale of two cities. I mean, if you have a stable yeah. asset and a strong buyer. Um, um, the, uh, um, uh, then, then you can, um, you can probably, st- I mean, we'll see if they close, they haven't closed yet, but, yeah, yeah. uh, but they're still getting decent, uh, leverage, uh, and, uh, interest rates from Fann- Fannie Mae's better than Freddie right now at the moment, but that could change tomorrow. Um, but I mean, we're seeing folks lock in the low 5% interest rate right now. Some, some buy it down below. I saw some, one group buy it down below a four or below yeah. a five, barely, but below a five. So, so there, you, you can do it. Um, um, but it, I, eventually, give it two, three months. I think you're going to see this. I think you're going to see blood in the streets um, on these deals. But they're going to need a lot of. Um, they're going to need a lot of capex. I'm expecting these deals to have been, you know, um, um, you know, a lot of deferred maintenance. Because uh, what happened in 23 is a lot of folks thought it was going to happen in 23, right? Um, right. There's blood in the streets, but yeah, yeah. but everybody seemed to be um, borrowers and lenders just kicking the can as far down as they can. Uh, well, I think they've kicked it about as far as they can here in the next couple, you know, so we'll see, I think here pretty soon, but 23 didn't happen just because everybody was playing nice or trying to play nice at the moment. Yeah. Um, it's it's and, a really and, interesting <laughs> point. Yeah. I mean, it, we've seen it. I, I remember a couple of years ago, people starting like rescue funds and stuff in multifamily. And it was just like a little too early, you know, like, like yeah. people had, you know, all this money saved and, and we've seen, you know, there's, like you said, there's some stuff, it's kind of quiet. It's kind of here or there, but there are just situations where, you know, and we've seen, you know, sometimes the lenders will work with people just saying, okay, well, we see, you know, hey, if we take this over or if we feel like this is not going to be good for anybody. So can we extend your terms and extend and pretend kind of stuff? And we're seeing some of that. And of course, with all the speculation that rates are, you know, just about to drop, which we don't know. I mean, they, <laughs> it's right. like the it trouble easy. is like no one really knows. Right. But right. I mean, ideally now, I, I think um, it could be a, a looking back, this could be a really great time to invest because, um, you know, when you buy, your buying price is fixed, your interest rate is adjustable. You know, you can always adjust later if, if rates go down. And so it's, uh, we, we know there's a great shortage of apartments. We know there's great, incredible demand for it. So if you find something that cash flows as a buyer, it's just, we're seeing, I don't know if you're seeing this as well, investor sentiment is, has changed a bit to where yeah. some people are saying like, I don't know if I want to do multifamily, right? I want to do other things. I want to save. I want to wait. Right. I want to, you know, and so are you seeing that as well with some investors that just, uh, particularly retail investors? I know there's a lot of big buyers are still buying, but there's a lot of retail investors that are like, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, 23, well, one, 23, like the deal flow is down 85%. So really yeah. no one knows the cap rate and no one knows what, how much money you can raise or not raise. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> but it did feel like the sentiment was very low. Uh, from kind of your retail investor in 23. I think 24 though, I mean, I've 
you know, this first quarter is about over, but I've taken so many phone calls from investors on, hey, when's the next, you know, multifamily deal coming? And, you know, and, and, and prior to that, them asking that, I had told them, hey, we're, we're focused on on these deals. We're bonding them 30, 35 percent, you know, minimum off the peak pricing. Um, and so that that got them excited. So I think I think, yeah. I mean, just like the family office has got on that, you know, uh, vulture vulture mentality in 22, like you said, a little early, I think. Yeah. Uh, um, I think the retail investors have joined them now. So I think you're going to see if, if you've got a deal, I, I mean, I don't know, no one knows this yet, but or I don't think anybody knows, but if you've got a deal where you're raising five to $10 million on a deal, that's 35% of the peak pricing. I, I, I feel like we could easily raise that today. Yeah. Yeah. And pretty quickly. Uh, but that's got to be the story is, is you got to be buying at the right, you know, at the right discount. Yeah, it's all about the basis you're coming in at and the story behind it. And I think I think it's right. Even what you're saying about triple net, there's a lot of education that goes into this. And that's where uh, oh, yeah. you know, people that are syndicators like you and I, it's like we spend a lot of time. And I see a lot of your videos and a lot of stuff that you're putting out there and emails. It's a lot of work, but it's it's so important that we take people on the journey with us and we educate kind of what's you know what's actually happening, what we're seeing. Um, Kenny, talk to us a little bit about um, shifting gears a little bit, but uh, for you... As a real estate investor, I know you've written a book. Um, I know you've, you know, you're a reader. You're, you know, you've a finance background. Uh, what's what's a book or a resource or something that's been helpful for you on your journey that you'd recommend for people that are interested to to learn? Sure, sure. And and, and I won't cop out and say "Bridge Dad, Poor Dad." Um, that is a good one. It was life changing for me. <laughs> that but is a good one. That, that is a good one. So if you haven't, oh, so this is my way, a sneaky way of saying there's two. So do that if you haven't read it. Uh, but then. Uh, um, I'd also read, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of business books just in general. So, um, I mean, I just read, I got, I'm looking at my uh, shelf right there. Um, <laughs> the latest one I just read, which is really good is the, um, book, uh, by Sam Zell. Uh, am I being yeah. too simple? Um, that's a great that's book. That's a good one. That's a good one. Um, yeah. Snowball that covers Warren Buffett's. That's a great one too. Yeah. Too. Um, Huge. and, uh, cause you're buying multifamily, you're really buying a business. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so it's, a, so it's all NOI driven. So it's, it's similar, uh, but to see how they built their companies is just fantastic and something to chase, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no. And I, I think, uh, reading books, it's, it's a great way. There's a quote that you'll be the same person five year, years from now, except for the books you read and the people that you meet. So it's just networking and education, right? That's really what it is. Absolutely. Makes it better. So it's awesome. Absolutely. Uh, well, Kenny, I just, uh, this is, this has gone really fast today. Just really enjoyed the time with you today. I just really wanted to say, I really value you who you are in the marketplace. You're the same person that I see, you know, at the conference and having a private conversation and on stage and whatever. And you're just, you're just a great guy bringing value to people and you've been doing it for a long time. So it's, it's no surprise that you've had the success that you've had, but uh, I encourage people just to reach out to Kenny and, and get in touch to hear about his deals and things that he's doing in all different, in, in different arenas. But uh, Kenny, what's the best way people can, can reach out and connect with you? Sure. Yeah. Um, best way is probably through our website. So wolf with an E dash investments.com. Um, and then, uh, we're on social media as well, Facebook, Instagram, all that fun stuff uh, as well. But, uh, that's probably the, the website's probably the best place to get a hold of us. And there's a place to put your email and set up a phone call, uh, uh, with our, with myself and our team. Awesome, man. Well, I appreciate you. Thanks for being here. We'll have to do this again. I look forward to seeing you. I think I'm going to be at your next uh, MFIN event in, uh, nice. in Denver on a, on a panel there. So I'm looking forward to that. Awesome. It'll be a lot of See fun. See you there. So. Awesome. All right. Okay. Thanks, man. All right. So I really love that episode with Kenny. Great guy, really has a lot of different things that he's doing. And he's found something that even when he started doing triple net, they were, they were like, you're crazy. What are you doing? Uh, but for passive investors, it gives uh, another way to diversify in different types of assets or at least get into them a different way. So I think it's important not to be diversified in a hundred different things, but maybe in 10 different things or five different things, or at least have some diversification, right? So I think that's important. So I encourage you to reach out to Kenny. Um, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Um, again, I like talking with people that are doing things that are in multifamily or outside of multifamily, other assets. And this was, I think, the first episode we've done in the last, I think, the last three years of the show uh, on just on Triple Net. So it was good. So I'd love to hear any feedback that you have. I'd love for you to share this with a friend. And if you do get involved with Triple Net or if you are a Triple Net investor, I'd love to hear from you. Shoot me an email, Bronson at BronsonEquity.com. And I uh, just love to hear any feedback from you of what you would like to see on future episodes, who I should interview. And really excited for some stuff to come uh, upcoming as far as different uh, guests, as well as different investment opportunities. I'm not quite ready to talk about yet, but we're getting very excited. So if you have, if you have not joined the Bronson Equity Investor Club, go to Bronson Equity 
facebook.com slash join and you'll be able to join our club set up a call with us we'll start a relationship be able to get you into some of our deal flow and you have the opportunity to invest with us in one of our deals so thanks for taking the time to educate yourself we look forward to seeing you on the next episode of the mailbox money show you've been listening to the mailbox money podcast for more free resources articles and videos go to bronsonequity.com there you can download your copy of the special report, The Single Best Investment Strategy During and After a Pandemic. None of the information shared here is an offer to buy a specific investment, and this is for educational purposes only. Consult your financial, legal, and tax professionals and use your own common sense before making any investment decisions. Thanks for joining us, and be sure to tune next time for more Mailbox Money.